Thank you. This is the Federalist Society Intellectual Property Practice Groups present. Uh, so we should thank the Federalist Society for bringing us together for this event. Uh, thank you to all of you for coming. The topic of the event, uh, the stars, if you will, are to my left and right, uh, Keith Hilton and Ron Cass. Keith and Ron uh, have produced a wonderful book, which is available for purchase outside. I bought this copy and asked them nicely and Sure enough, they autographed it for me. So I, I encourage you to consider doing the same. Uh, I've already enjoyed thumbing through it and look forward to reading more of it. But to really get a sense of the book, it helps to get a sense of the authors and their views of the book. So what we'll do today is have the authors each uh, make some initial remarks and then uh, open the floor for Q&A with the authors and we'll end a little bit before the allotted time so that if you'd like to speak with the authors individually and, and uh, ask them as I did to sign your book, I'm sure they'd be delighted to oblige. Um, I didn't have to pay them too much for that. So Ron uh, Cass, to my right, uh, was uh, has, has worked really in a lot of different fields and in a lot of different positions. Of course, he was at the International Trade Commission. Uh, he's been a law professor and dean and, and now uh, runs Cass and Associates, co-runs Cass and Associates. I do, I do what I'm told at Cass and Associates. <laughs> Follows orders at Cass and Associates. <laughs> um, and uh, Keith Hilton uh, is uh, a law professor uh, at BU, Boston University, uh, uh, where Ron had been. Uh, Keith is the Honorable Paul J. Lycos uh, professor at Boston University. They both have written individually and together a number of pieces on a range of topics, including intellectual property. And this book is about intellectual property. And uh, without further ado, let me, I think Ron will start. Let me turn the mic over to Ron. Well, thank you, Scott. And, and thank you, Dean and the Federal Society for putting this on. Uh, it's a, a delight to, to be here talking about uh, this project. Uh, let me start with uh, a, a serious uh, story. Uh, it involves, and, and you will notice that this is a, a true story, as these always are, uh, it involves four rabbis who were having a uh, very heated debate about a, uh, a, a point in the Talmud. And they, they argued and argued and argued about what the meaning was, and finally, one of the rabbis said, well, let's vote. And the vote came out three to one. And the rabbi who was on the losing end said, this is just wrong. It, it is wrong. You are not right. This is, this is completely wrong. In fact, I would like God to, to say that I'm right, to give a sign. And so the, the sky darkened, and there was a flash of lightning. And the other rabbi says, that doesn't prove anything. It could have been happenstance. And the, the, the rabbi on the losing end of the vote said, um, I, I would like another sign. And so there was a big clap of, of thunder and lightning, and the ground shook, and the, the sky uh, you know, kind of vibrated. And the rabbi said, that, that doesn't prove it either. And the rabbi who was on the losing end said, one more sign. And a voice came down from the heavens and said, he's right. <laughs> At which point the other rabbi said, OK, three to two. So this project uh, is uh, our effort to try to put some balance into the debate about intellectual property that's taking place now. Uh, at the end of it, the people on the other side might just say uh, three to two still. But uh, we, we think that there's a real disconnect between what's happening in the world and what's happening in scholarship about intellectual property. Uh, I started teaching intellectual property in the mid-1980s. And I started teaching it because at Boston University, where I was at the time, the only person teaching intellectual property was named to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Massachusetts and stopped teaching intellectual property. So we needed somebody to do it. And having taught most of the other courses in the law school, I figured, you know, why not that one? And the people who had seen me teach the other courses said, well, maybe that one. Um, so 
between then and, and, and now, uh, I, mean, I should say since Scott's going on to the ITC, I, when I went to the ITC, uh, mostly what it did was anti-dumping, and I didn't understand anti-dumping. I would swear somebody had said that means if people somewhere else in the world pay more, we insist that Americans pay more for things. Um, but I understood the intellectual property cases that the, the International Trade Commission had. And I was very excited about that, which my colleagues regarded as, as akin to being excited by the caution flag in a NASCAR race. I mean, it just, it, it had that much excitement for other people. Well, well, you look at the world today, and intellectual property accounts for more and more of the economy. It accounts for more than a third today of the U.S. economy in IP-intensive industries. It accounts for more than 60 percent of the value of U.S. exports. It accounts for more than 50 percent of economic growth. I mean, it's a really important set of things tied to intellectual property, to, to innovation, patents, and copyrights, and trademarks. And if you look at what's happening in the law, more and more lawyers are practicing this. More and more people are teaching it. I think there are a dozen people on the faculty now at my old school that are, are teaching this. More and more students are taking it. The courses are jammed. It's just a wonderful thing uh, to be doing, except that if you read what academics write about it, most of the writing is telling you why IP rights are bad, why they need to be cut back, why they, why they shouldn't be as strong as they are. So when Keith and I started this project, it really was looking at what was being written and trying to figure out how to bring some balance to it. Um, and we do this from a perspective that really is based in property rights. If you look at property rights, those turn out to be good things for a lot of different purposes. Around the world, societies that are based in strong property rights – that give people freedom to trade and exchange and make their own decisions to control things based on those rights, those societies tend to succeed. We ran a, a long real-world experiment in Europe as to which systems work better, those that had good property rights or those where there was more centralized control, and it turns out property rights kind of win. Well, if you look at the intellectual property right debate, it tends to start in the academy with the statement that intellectual property rights are different because ideas are public goods. Anybody can use them. They, they, they are non-rivalrous in the economist's word. I love economics because there is no thought so simple that you can't make it sound complicated <laughs> if you give it uh, the right economic and It's non-rivalrous. It means that, that you know, different people can use ideas and it doesn't cost anything. And therefore, they ought to be all available for free, according to everybody who's copywriting their own work when they're writing books uh, in the academy. <laughs> well, I mean, that, it's a great idea because economically, it would be a wonderful thing if everything were available for free, except for the fact that you don't get so much produced. If the, uh, if the goose lays the golden egg and doesn't get anything for, for laying the eggs, sooner or later the goose stops laying it or people stop feeding it gold uh, to lay those eggs. So we, we looked at the, the literature in this and we tried to construct a, a fairly common sense view of the world based in an analysis of how the different parts of intellectual property rights actually work. I mean it turns out that it costs something to, to make intellectual property. And it costs something usually to distribute and use intellectual property, even if the idea itself at bottom is something that it, it can be shared without extra cost. So we look at different uh, types of intellectual property. We look at patent and trademark and trade secret and copyright and try to examine the basic legal framework for each and see whether it makes sense, whether it's too protective, not protective enough, what it's doing. And in most of these areas, when you look at it, it turns out that analytically, the law makes pretty good sense. The law has, over time, generally struck pretty sensible accommodations <clears throat> between the costs and benefits of protecting intellectual property. If you take, for instance, you know, in the copyright world, uh, copyright and patent differ because patent covers deeply – the applications of certain types of practical ideas, but only for a very limited period of time, whereas copyright for a much longer period 
gives a much shallower protection, but only against direct copying. And when you look at what it is that is the real innovation that we want to encourage and protect in patent and what we really want to encourage and protect in copyright, those, those both make sense. It makes sense because in copyright you're protecting a particular type of expression. You know, when Shakespeare uh, says a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, you know, that, that's kind of a unique way of capturing a thought. The basic story there, boy meets girl from the wrong side of the track, they fall in love, bad things happen. You know, there are lots of different versions of that story and there's no reason to protect the basic story idea and it wasn't original to Shakespeare either. So a lot of the basic nature of the intellectual property regime really works and works well and makes sense. You have some ways of adjusting at the margin, there are doctrines in each one of these areas that really are there as a safety valve to protect against overprotecting or underprotecting the right at issue. But we, we look area by area and they're all pretty well, pretty sensibly developed. One of the objections you hear in academia though is that what's happening is that the law isn't standing still, it's becoming more protective of intellectual property so that friends in the copyright world, the length of the copyright has increased. And again, if you take a look at the costs and benefits of what's involved, this also makes sense. It used to be very difficult to copy things. When I started practicing law, uh, I had two secretaries, not because I was important, but precisely because I was unimportant. I was doing a lot of, of writing on things. And what secretaries did back then was they typed and proofread and typed and proofread and corrected and then started typing all over again because we didn't have plain paper copying. We didn't have computers. We didn't have autocorrect. We didn't have any of the things that make it easy to produce things without injecting new mistakes. Well, as we have made it easier to be more productive, we've also made it easier to copy and to copy cheaply and perfectly. And today you can do that with a push of a button where it, it used to take somebody with great skill. Counterfeiters really are upset at some of the changes that have happened uh, in, in the world. But if it's going to be easier to copy and steal things and distribute them widely, then it also is going to take better protection to induce people to actually engage in the process that creates the works. There are a variety of places where the system has issues. If you look at what's happening in the smartphone world, some of the patent wars there, we can talk about some of the stresses that are there. We can talk about some of the difficulties uh, that exist in trying to get things distributed in a digital world where a lot happens in the cloud. But by and large, the system works, it works well, we don't have a dearth of innovations. We don't have a dearth of things being produced. You look at America in the last 30 years, it's an incredibly inventive society. It's an incredibly innovative society. And, and I start, uh, let me end uh, with this thought. I, I start with a fairly conservative proposition. When I was in, in law school, I was at the University of Chicago. And one day, painters showed up. Now this is a building that's glass and gray stone. And the painters showed up and began painting the gray stone gray. <laughs> and I asked the dean uh, at the time, Phil Neal, uh, I, I asked him, I said, Dean Neal, uh, I, I really have a, a curiosity here. Why is it the painters are painting the gray stone gray? And Phil, being a conservative, looked at it, puffed on his pipe, thought for a moment, and said, it's okay, it's the same color. If, we don't, if things are working fine and we don't change them, we're probably better off. And, and, and that's the insight I would end with. Thank you, Ron. And uh, if we could now turn to your, your uh, co former colleague, co-author. Uh, still my colleague. Still, still colleagues, colleagues, colleagues forever. Friend, colleagues forever. <laughs> Keith Hilton, please, Keith. Thank you, thank, thank you Scott. And uh, thanks to the Federalist Society for hosting this event. So uh, Ron has done a great job of covering what we're thinking about in writing this book. And so I'll just fill in a f few footnotes in here. Uh, so uh, maybe I should start off with um, my approach to the book uh, to the extent that there's, I have a slightly different view. I think we agree uh, in, in general on the views that we take, but we have different um, 
things that we want to emphasize. Um, like Ron, I was concerned about the literature in IP and the message that was uh, sent by most of the uh, writing by the dominant professors in IP at this stage, which is uh, which suggests that, as, as Ron said, that intellectual property um, is largely a bad thing, uh, largely a negative, largely a social waste. Uh, but more than that, I think what concerned me was the absence of any very solid policy framework that set out in this literature, or at least the policy framework that set out struck me to be inadequate. Inadequate in the sense of providing a positive theory or explanation of what is going on in the case law, because there's so much in the structure of IP law and in the case law that is totally inconsistent with the zero-sum social waste view that has been promoted by um, many of the prominent uh, intellectual property professors uh, today. Um, so I think we were, both, we were both upset about that, and and, uh, and and most of what I've done through my career is work on policy frameworks uh, uh, in the form of simple economic models. Um, and so that that's what uh, made me eager to get involved with, with this project with, with Ron. Um, the audience, uh, we're hoping that, of course, everyone reads the book. Uh, one audience I can think of right, right away would be law students who um, are taking courses and they're confronted confronted with the zero-sum social waste view, and I think they need to be given a policy framework that uh, is both, um, both suggests the uh, welfare benefits that come from intellectual property laws and provide a, a consistent positive theory of the case law and of the general structure uh, of the law. And I would hope that if students are exposed to this view early on, that it would it would enrich their own education. Uh, it would make them better lawyers. It would give them a basis for predicting uh, what's happening in the case law and how things sh should turn out. Much better foundation than is provided in uh, much of the uh, current literature. Um, there is a, so the policy framework in this book is explicitly utilitarian, uh, and it can be simplified uh, even further. Uh, we, we stress we have a very simple policy framework that we take through several areas of IP law. We march through several uh, big parts of IP law and apply the same policy framework to see to explain how the law is consistent or can be understood or justified in terms of the policy framework. So what we're doing is we're the, and the main the main uh, concerns in this framework uh, is uh, a, a, or at least the two main concerns are static costs and dynamic costs, or I could call it static costs and dynamic benefits. And I can uh, describe very simply how that policy framework works. Um, so static costs, what am I referring to? I, I'm referring to the fact that uh, intellectual property um, allows the person who's granted that property some kind of uh, of a uh, monopoly. It, it's not it's not a real monopoly in the case where there are substitutes to the product, but it, it lessens competition. It gives some degree of mon monopoly power, and there's a static cost associated with monopolization. And if you take in any economics, then you know that monopolies restrict output, <coughs> raise prices. The static cost is the cost to consumers because a lot of consumers just can't afford the monopolized product. And so IP law, to some, to some extent, imposes those costs on society. That's part of the framework. But then there's the other side, which is, which is the dynamic benefit. Or we could look at it, flip it around, and say the reduction in dynamic cost. And that is that IP rights give people incentives to invest, to create new products, uh, to, to convert ideas into useful things. Um, and of course, a lot of people say, well, inventors aren't really concerned about money. But there are people who are concerned about money who are often backing these inventors. And so what IP does in many cases is provide a bridge between those financiers and, and uh, the final outcome where you put those ideas into real, uh, real useful things. So the policy framework we're, we're, we're using through this book it looks at this simple trade-off between static costs and dynamic costs, or static costs and dynamic benefits very simple, but I think it's a powerful tool that we can take and just use it throughout IP law. 
and make sense of what's in the case law, make sense of some very broad distinction, and then go down to a further level of detail, make sense of specific cases uh, and decisions in the case law. Um, you know, I said that, there, that the uh, other view, the competing view, is what I've referred to as a zero sum, zero sum, or social waste, well, social waste point of view. Um, and that other view, again, which is kind of the dominant view, um, though we're hoping to put it to rest with, with this book, um, is that uh, IP law is just a version of rent seeking. It's just a version of a group of concentrated people with concentrated interests getting laws to favor them and redistribute wealth from the public to to themselves, to this, to this uh, small group of IP rights holders. Um, and, and that's a view that, that uh, again, is fairly, fairly negative, that uh, it doesn't uh, make you think that uh, uh, IP laws serve any useful purpose, uh, but that is the view that we're going against. Um, so again, uh, the specific, you know, the, the simple mach machine or policy framework, policy algorithm that we're applying, we take through various areas, patent law, for example, there's this very general distinction between ideas, abstract ideas, and, and things that have a useful, uh, specific use. Uh, and we uh, look carefully at the, what the courts have said in this area, and we use the framework, the static versus dynamic cost trade-off, to make sense of the distinction that courts make between the protection provided to abstract ideas versus things with specific utility. Trade secrets, same, same issue in the area of trade secrets. Uh, there's a trade-off between static costs and dynamic uh, benefits in terms of how much protection that you provide. Trademarks, same thing. Trademarks, uh, you have this spectrum between generic trademarks versus uh, generic terms versus fanciful or specific terms, and the amount of protection gets higher as you move toward fanciful and specific terms. Uh, protection is low and maybe non-existent for generic terms. Uh, how do you understand that? We argue in the book that this trade-off between static and dynamic costs gives you the insight that allows you to understand that and to understand what's happening, happening in a lot of the case law. IP and, and antitrust, intellectual property and antitrust, one of the messages that comes out of our approach is that antitrust is largely useful around the edges, largely useful around the edges of IP to make sure that people aren't using IP rights uh, to sort of mask, uh, uh, you know, a very bad, obviously, anti-competitive practices. But uh, outside of that, outside of the use of antitrust on the edges of IP, uh, the message that comes out of our book is one that's uh, fairly skeptical about uh, how interventionist you, you want, you'd like to be with in antitrust, how much antitrust can benefit. Uh, the world by invading intellectual property and getting into the guts of the determination of whether an intellectual property right is desirable or not. So um, I, 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 that's pretty much uh, all I want to say. We're hoping that uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, students uh, take a look at it, and I'm certainly hoping that lawyers, judges, everyone else in the world takes a look at this approach too. Thanks. We have uh, uh, two microphones for two different sides of the room. Uh, I'll keep notes. If you just catch my eye and raise your hand, I'll make sure the cue is kept and, and the microphones make their, make their way towards you. Uh, let's open the floor for, for questions. We have one on this side. I, uh, I will also say that as we're two law professors, if you don't ask us questions, we will ask you questions. <laughs> Ron will ask questions. Um, my question is for Professor Cass. So since we've moved from first to invent for, for, to first to file, is that better, worse, or are we too late? Well, uh, first of all, let me start by saying I don't think in the great scheme of things it makes a huge difference. I think the way the two schemes have been implemented around the world makes them much more similar than dissimilar. Having said that, um, there, the benefit of first to file is an administrative benefit, but I think there is a, a dynamic cost 
in that you want to encourage bigger innovations. That, that's what you really should want most of all. And the first to file system moves you back a little bit towards smaller inventions and quicker patenting on them. So I, I would not have favored it. There's obviously a benefit to being on the same page as the rest of the world in terms of our patent rules. But I think that substantively it is a very small step in the wrong direction. Can I get some? Please. So, so I, I agree with, with Ron. I, I don't think there's a whole lot at stake. I happen to benefit from having a neighbor who's an inventor. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, every now and then at some block party, I run into the guy and I can talk to him about IP issues. And uh, I would call him a garage inventor, but he just built a three story building on his property uh, where he invents things and he's building a new kind of car. So this guy's a really serious uh, garage inventor, I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I, I, I had a conversation which I said, well, what's the story be, between, be, uh, about this first to file versus first to invent question? And he, was, he said, well, you know, I, I don't like the move to first to file because, you know, for a guy like me who's a relatively small inventor, though, again, he's, he's got a big operation for being a small inventor. Um, he said, you know, I'm, this puts me at a disadvantage relative to big corporations that have a staff already and ready to go in and file these things. Um, so uh, so they, there could be some, there could be some dynamic cost in that sense, which I think Ron referred to briefly. Um, so that's, and that's the only uh, issue that, uh, at least that, I, that I've come across uh, that makes, makes me think, well, there's something there to be concerned about. But, uh, overall, um, I don't know if there's a. I, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced that uh, it's it's going to turn out to be a big difference. Uh, and again, I'll continue to keep the cue. So just catch my eye. And in the meantime, we have here. Thank you. Um, I'm having a hard time understanding this uh, uh, dominant academic viewpoint that you all have described. Um, I don't. I mean, if you take a pharmaceutical company. Um, can't these academics see that uh, the company will have no incentive to try to create new drugs to deal with, uh, you know, diseases if, there's, if they're not going to have any protection? I mean, it, to me, it's, I just don't understand how they can hold to that perspective. Well, I mean, first of all, you have to understand in academia, something that seems common sense doesn't get you any points with your colleagues. <laughs> So, you know, right, right there, you know, you, you, you're on the wrong foot with that academics. Uh, the, the second thing is, is that what, what the dominant uh, strand of writing would say is, look, a lot of things people will invent by accident. A lot of things people will invent just because they like inventing things. And the things that, that you really need, like pharmaceuticals, which cost roughly a billion dollars to uh, create and run through all the different trials you need to make sure that, that they're safe and effective, uh, for things like that, we'll have a prize system where we will have something out there. We'll, we'll pay people for inventing these things rather than giving them a patent and exclusive rights. Um, and and there, there are a variety of different settings where some form of other incentive will help get things into the market. And there are some number of things that will be invented no matter what. From our standpoint, though, uh, without the inducement uh, of actually getting uh, paid for it, it, it's hard to get as many people to do it. And not only that, if you're trying to do this without property rights, then the way you have to do it is by figuring out what the value is of different innovations and rewarding people from the central authority. Uh, it turns out that both patent and copyright tend to work pretty well as a, a way of gearing the reward to social value by letting people go out there and sell it. Um, copyright has a really low bar. Anybody can copyright anything. But most copyrights are worth exactly the uh, time and energy it takes to put the C with a circle on the, on the piece of paper. Uh, on the other hand, the market is what tells you what it's worth. It's not somebody sitting in an office somewhere. So um, it, while we will make fun of our fellow academics as much as possible, 
Um, th there's something there, I just think, you know, and, and a lot, all of them will say, look, we like the system. We just want to have less of it. We want to improve the system by having less of what we have. And um, th there's always a theoretical case for it. Um, but a lot of things that work in theory just aren't the same in practice. Can I add something? Sure. I'll, uh, although I'm, I'm sitting as an academic right now, so maybe I'll say some things that will, if they get out, will you know, cause me pain as soon as I get back to work. Just but speak into the recording device. That's <laughs> right, yeah, let's look, look directly into the device. Um, but I guess there's a, there's a, you can offer, here's a very simple economic model of what happens in academic discussions. So let's say, uh, let's take the case of a drug that someone develops and the academic's position is, uh, don't give a patent, you know, just let them develop the drug and then give it away for free. Well, you say that's, that's a dumb idea. Uh, so as an academic, I get up and I say, but I'm sincere and don't you think this is good? Are you attacking my sincerity? Don't you realize that this is good for people and therefore it should be done? Um, so to some extent in the academic world, posturing on the basis of sincerity and a sincere desire to help people uh, always gets you somewhere. It always, uh, it always works. For some, for some reason, it always works. Um, the harder argument is to say there's a market out there, there are costs and benefits, people need a reward to be able to do things, because now you're no longer talking about sincerity. Now you're talking about money and costs and benefits and things like that. And so you're, you're taking the position of you're, you're now arguing in favor of self-interest and things like that. Um, so it's, 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 it seems like this is an obvious argument, one that ought to be, shouldn't be hard to make. Um, though, of course, I'm not trivializing what we've done because we, we put a lot of work into going into details and trying to uh, provide a positive theory that provides, that is in some sense falsifiable by seeing how well the theory fits the case law. The basic idea behind there is fairly simple. But it's one that, uh, as an academic, you find yourself kind of in opposition making that argument in a lot of uh, workshop settings, or, or in the, even in some of the journals as well. Uh, unfortunate, but I think true. So I'm, I'm keeping the queue. And uh, we have several people. So uh, we'll try to keep the Q&A uh, uh, going. Uh, please, over here. Um, as you know, there's um, a lot of controversy over the legitimacy of business method patents. Uh, to what extent uh, does your book address uh, business method patents, and uh, what is your uh, perspective on uh, business method patents? Do you want to start this time? No, Ron should start oh, this okay. time. We, we do talk about business method patents, and, and we are, are generally unfavorable <laughs> in our discussion of them, because an awful lot of what is covered under the heading of business method patents uh, are the sort of innovations that are a routine part of competition among businesses and the sort of ideas that really are distinguishable from the inventive ideas at the heart of patent. Uh, almost all the sort of uh, cases, you know, the point and click, the, 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 the one click method of purchasing, a, a lot of the, the things that have gotten into the public domain have been uh, things that from my standpoint, should never have been patented to begin with. Uh, the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court went different ways on this, and, and you can defend either one. Uh, we think from a policy standpoint, the Federal Circuit had it right. Uh, from a textual standpoint, uh, and just reading the law, the Supreme Court had it right. But both uh, had the effect of cutting back on the scope uh, of business method patents, and we think that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I really there's I don't know if I can add anything to Ron to what Ron said. I mean, we y yes, we're we're negative on business method patents, um, and we uh, express some concern in the book about the approach the Supreme Court took in the Bilski decision, because what the Supreme Court seems to have done in Bilski is to take the statute, get a dictionary read the statute with the dictionary, ah, oh, we think this word means that, so therefore how, that's how we'll read the statute. And what we're trying to do in this book is set out the policy arguments for understanding and for thinking about the scope of IP rights. And so we're a little worried about uh, any time we see a court uh, to just take a statute with a dictionary because then they aren't talking about the policies, they aren't talking about 
the cost and benefit trade-offs that go behind understanding how far a particular how far the scope of particular statutory provision should have. Um, so I think we we're we're we're, we're in agreement uh, and a little worried about uh, the the approach reflected uh, in Bilski. We hope that's not that's not a dominant approach in the new cases that come out. Please. Um, I was delighted to be here today for a couple of reasons. First of all, John Van, who's here, and I were um, kind of early uh, an ear early army that basically the changed the law about how copyright applies to computer software, which means it doesn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there are unintended consequences from that that I don't know that I certainly appreciated, which is our, our argument basically was that, or my argument basically was that. It didn't fit the, the, the really the requirements of copyright, but that there would be patent protection available if you needed that. And I assumed that it would be rationally applied. What happened is everybody in the, that went over to the patent office, which I never thought was going to happen. There was like a skew of people. Um, the you know they gave patents to everybody, and now that whole fight is going on. Now, I argued or had a debate with um, Bruce Lehman 20 years ago in the Copyright Society, and I said, look, people are going to buy software, whether it's copyright or patent, because the machine is useless sitting there. So there's going to be a market for it, whether or not you have intellectual property. Um, how misled was that? <laughs> and was I right? Or, I mean, yeah, and maybe the answer is a patent with a very, first of all, better patents, which I do believe the, the um, current uh, PTO basically is addressing that issue by really taking a look at trying to be much more careful about what they do in the future, hoping that this, the the garbage ones will, you know, the time will expire on them and then we'll be working on important ones. So, um, well, how wrong was I? And is the other answer maybe just a shorter life term or lifespan for patents for those types of things? Is that a question or it's, is it's, it's, dialogue? It's, it's, it's two questions and we'll answer both. Okay, thank so, you. So I'll, I'll, I'll guess I'll start this time. Um, so uh, there's a book by uh, Besson and Moyer. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an empirical analysis of patents. Uh, the title is Patent Failure. Uh, and one of the points that they make is that software patents don't seem to, uh, to stand up that well in their empirical analysis because the, I think their conclusion is that the cost of litigation swamped the value of the average um, oh, software, software patent because of the uncertainty, the challenges. Um, so maybe we're looking at an area in which uh, things have gone too far and there needs to be some special statutory framework because um, you, you, you know, people are looking at what's, what's happening here and they're thinking, well, well, maybe this is something bad about patents in general. Um, and that's the danger of having software patents and with everything else that people will then think, oh, well, the problems we see with software patents are true of patents in general. Going back to Contu. Which, which, but I think that what's happening here is that, that there's some special problems with software patents that may require a different statutory framework. Uh, I never disagree with Keith. Um, <laughs> I never disagree but, with Ron. <laughs> but I, I, I do think, uh, let me just say two quick things here. First. Software, I mean, you're right, the expressive part of software is very different than the sort of artistic expression that we think about as the core of copyright. But copyright also covers a variety of not terribly artistic expression. Uh, my wife um, has said about some of my academic writing that um, it is sufficiently gripping that once you put it down, you just can't pick it up again. Um, you know, not, but, but it is copyrighted. Um, not not everything that is, is copyrighted or copyrightable, you know, has that sort of flair of Shakespeare or Manet or something like that. And I think in many ways, copyright was a better fit with software because it gave shallower protection and it protected against copying, which really is is what you want in that. It's not to say that there can't be something that is sufficiently innovative and inventive that it's appropriate for patent. But I think you have to be very careful. The only part that I, I think I may be a little bit off of, uh, from uh, from where Keith was, and that is, I, I think Keith is right that it's a special area. It's at the border of 
uh, of patent and, and copyright, and we have to be very careful there. I, I'm generally opposed to carve-outs. So I'm, I'm generally opposed to creating special regimes because usually the, we can work these out if we are sensitive to the core parts of the law within each area. And I think if we had been more careful that things truly were innovative and uh, not obvious from prior art in software patents, we'd be in a better place, we'd have m many fewer of them, and we'd still have protection under copyright instead of trying to double up. Okay, we have a number of people in the queue. Uh, uh, please. Okay, uh, uh, Ray Van Dyke. Um, following up on one of the comments before about the first to uh, invent and all that, that's just part of the broad legislation of the American Invents Act of 2011 and that uh, there's all numerous other pr uh, proceedings in there that are totally new on challenges to patents. And these, we're going to be dealing with these issues in the next decades. So I, I would argue, using your vernacular, that this is a seriously uh, detriment to the dynamic benefits of patents in that it interferes with the bridge to financiers if a cloud on the patent is going to be um, there for the length of the patent. And this point is, 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 is pretty much promoted by Chief, former Chief Judge uh, Paul Michel of the Federal Circuit. So um, have you guys, did you guys address that in the book as well, the new Patent Act and its effect on the patent system? We don't, we don't really say a lot about it because it came in, you know, really where we were in the copy editing uh, process for the book. Um, but I, I will say just two quick things. One is, as somebody who's concerned about the law, I think clarity and certainty are wonderful things. And the second is, as someone who consults with lawyers, I think uncertainty and unclarity is a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've, yes. Um, I'm Bill Richterman. Last week, Chief Judge Rader of the Federal Circuit spoke at New York, Univers uh, New York Bar, and he talked about the eBay decision. Uh, and say, essentially said the Supreme Court had gone too far uh, in deciding eBay, making it much more difficult to get an injunction. If the, the right to a patent is really, if the patent is the right to exclude, uh, do you think Chief Judge Rader was correct about that? Was eBay out of balance? And, and if so, what has that done to uh, IP and patents in the last six years, seven years? I'll go well, first of all, I, I never criticize the Supreme Court because I have too many friends on it. Um, I, I think that the what eBay did was it, it didn't say you can't get an injunction. It said um, you have to, to satisfy the traditional four-factor test, and if you satisfy that, you get the injunction. Um, we, we do know that uh, courts have cut back on injunctions after that, um, that you have – you know, perhaps a, a, a one in uh, four shot of beating an injunction now where it was, you know, one in, you know, a hundred before. Uh, but the, the uh, I think the test analytically is just fine. Uh, I think, on the other hand, that having a right to exclude is the core of the, the patent and that, by and large, that means you should be able to enforce it through an injunction. So, um, I, I, I wouldn't criticize the test in the Supreme Court. I think we still are in the process of working out the application of it, though. Well, I'll, so I'll add something to this. So uh, uh, I, I, I teach torts and uh, apply economic analysis to torts and talk about injunctions sometimes. And th so there's a, a general framework um, that has come out of uh, the economics literature uh, that I think is still pretty good, still applicable to this area, and that, that would say something like an injunction um, is easy to defend when someone has purposefully, intentionally taken something of, of some property of someone else. Uh, and then in other areas where the property rights are less clear, then the traditional balancing test that eBay talks about is uh, more useful. So. Um, so I, I guess the only the only problem I, I, I would point to is that it would be nicer if eBay kind of if the court made an effort to sort of stick with some of the common law on injunctions in general, which is is a fair there's a large body of common law involving injunctions and in property and nuisance disputes, and the doctrines that are involved in there could 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 be u useful to the court in thinking about injunctions and patent cases. Uh, as well. 
Uh, and so I think that's the main criticism I would offer of, of the eBay decision. Um, and we talk about this in our book. We talk about the, the economics of injunctions. A brief discussion uh, and a brief uh, mention of the eBay case. But we don't, have, we don't go into a lot of detail on this question. Please. Uh, thank you. Um, I assume based on the discussion thus far, though, please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, Keith and Ron, you are generally in favor of free markets for intellectual property rights, that is, the free exchange of patent rights and uh, copyrights and trademarks and so forth, um, which leads to the question, non-practicing entities. How do they figure into your analysis? Do they figure into your analysis? Uh, uh, I'll leave it at that, except, of course, your framework seems to talk about remuneration to inventors, and by definition, NPEs are not. So how do, how do they figure into the analysis? You want to so you mean, you mean trolls? Well, I was trying to be, I was trying to be polite. You're using the, <laughs> the polite way, non-practicing entities. Um, so they're not necessarily a bad Thing. Uh, you know, again, take the case of the neighbor who has the three-story garage for invention. Um, I'm pretty sure he finds trolls uh, useful people to have around because he wants to give all of his time to inventing and he doesn't want to spend time trying to enforce his IP rights. So the sensible thing for him is to spend his time in the garage and sell his right to a troll uh, who will enforce it. So this is, so in a sense, this is a good thing. This, in theory, this is great to have someone who specializes in enforcement and let the inventors invent. And at that level, uh, trolls aren't a problem. Uh, trolls, I think, are kind of more symptoms than causes of the disease. You know, they're kind of, you can look at what they do and say, aha, maybe there's a problem, but maybe it's not these guys. Maybe the problem is deeper than the troll. Uh, and so in areas such as software patents, um, Maybe the problems we have with the trolls are just due to the uncertainty of the law, the bad incentives that are in there, uh, and not so much to the fact, not due to the fact that, that trolls I exist. I think that the non-practicing entities include the individual inventor, includes uh, the, the company that buys and enforces patents, includes universities that employ people to do research and a variety of other things. And uh, both Keith and I have done some work after the book uh, in this area, and uh, the, the trying to, to cabin this a little bit, it's a it's a complicated set of issues, where I think the fact that something is a non-practicing entity complicates the practical working out of arrangements that big businesses have, uh, but it, it shouldn't be a stopper to the analysis. And I I, I will also add um, one of the important things for people to keep in mind about IP rights is that they are very important to little guys. You know, the big businesses generally can work things out on their own even without strong IP rights, although strong, clear IP rights obviously make a difference. Um, in a lot of areas, if you're a small uh, company, small firm, ind independent uh, enterprise, the IP rights mean everything to you. Please. Do you, do you think the movement from uh Treating violations of copyright, other IP, to uh, a crime from a contract action is a problem at this point. You, you want to start? Or? I'll let you, yeah. you take that. I, mean, I, I think uh, when you deal with things on a criminal basis, um, I, I think you're dealing with a different set of things than you generally are when you're talking about uh, civil actions. Um, if you're talking about a, a criminal enforcement process, you're talking about generally intentional, organized activity that can't be addressed effectively through civil means. And sometimes we talk about piracy and counterfeiting operations. That really is what we're talking about. Um, other times we're talking about things where the law, the, the extent of the rights are unclear, where there are numerous overlapping rights that people will step on by accident. And I think you just have to be careful to sort out what falls in each category. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Brandon Butler. So I was interested to hear you say that your, the foundation of your critique is, in, is utilitarian uh, because you know, the sort of the copy left or you know, copyright skeptic uh, tradition from Macaulay to Bill Patry has been kind of a utilitarian tradition. And the folks in the conservative movement are, who are kind of skeptical now, Jerry Brito and Tom Bell, 
kind of the foundation of their argument seems to be that uh, if copyright is not a natural right, but rather a utilitarian right, then we can start messing with the term and thinking about whether it makes sense. Did you consider a, a, a kind of natural right or Lockean theory or any other alternative to utilitarianism as a way to strong, more strongly ground your argument? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, but we have a, discussion, a chapter discussing various theories of property rights in, in general. Uh, and so if you're into that, we have a chapter for you. Uh, the, um, you know, I think utilitarianism uh, is is the right framework, and what and it's not really a critique. This is a po a positive theory of intellectual property law. So it's trying to justify, make sense. On, on the other hand, we also recognize the limits too, and so this is not just applauding everything that we see. Uh, it's 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 it's. Uh, using the theory to make sense of what we see, and what we see does include limits on property rights as well. Um, the, uh, the, the natural right view, the Lockean approach to intellectual property rights, uh, you know, maybe it has, we discussed it in the book, maybe it has some strategic value to someone, to a proponent, because it doesn't involve messing around with details, and it's not really subject to empiricism. But we ultimately we think the utilitarian approach is, is the right approach, which, is, which means that the argument is empirically grounded. It means that we, it can be falsified. It means that uh, we have to, uh, to the extent that we're making a persuasive argument, as a positive theory, it has to be consistent with much most of the facts. Um, but I think, I, I think that's the better approach for an, a topic such as this. You can, can make a case that if you look at the UN Declaration of, of uh, Human Rights, that intellectual property rights would fall under the Declaration. You can make a case for a natural right theory uh, of intellectual property rights. On the other hand, that doesn't get you very far away from where you have to be uh, to do the sort of hard work of figuring out what the doctrine should look like. And they inevitably, all the different theoretical bases for the right wind up collapsing into the same set of questions. So from our standpoint, addressing them essentially in a cost-benefit framework makes it easier to do it carefully and critically and avoid some of the, the difficult analytical uh, terminological problems you get with a different starting point, but it doesn't matter that much. Uh, so next door. Uh, th thank you. T to what extent uh, is a lot of what, at least from your presentation, it sounds a lot of what we're talking about here is you're, you're, you're attacking a straw man, meaning there are, I'm sure there are academics that really are highly skeptical of intellectual property rights in general. but. Certainly, based on the scholarship I've seen, I mean, the vast majority are really dealing with pretty narrow technical questions, and to the extent they want to dial it back, they're talking about dialing it back in specific areas. I mean, you yourselves have acknowledged maybe there needs to be dialing back with business method patents and software patents. And the issue that Judge Braden and I were working on really wasn't whether software generally should be protectable under copyright. It was the much more technical question of should software interface specifications be covered by copyright? Is reverse engineering a fair use or not? I mean, really narrow technical issues where, you know, I think the vast majority of legal academics would sort of basically accept the basic propositions of that 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 there should be uh, uh, IP protection, and we're really talking about optimizing the level and then figuring out in specific cases, you know, should it be protected or not? Well, the you're right that a lot of the conversation gets down eventually to the details. But the, the tide of academic writing has been strongly against the expansion of intellectual property right protections and toward the uh, contraction of those protections for almost 20 years uh, or, or so. And it has become more so rather than less so over time. Uh, the, and you do find some academics who are very strongly opposed to IP rights. You find some who are strongly of the view that any focus on incentivizing people with money 
is a bad thing and is misleading. And more than just a little bit at the, at the margin, we really are headed in a different direction than the dominant trend in academic writing. Uh, I, I think both Keith and I have read enough of the uh, writing that uh, it's, it's not, you know, we, we don't want to say everybody is totally opposed to IP rights. Uh, on the other hand, there is a, a theme that they should be reduced, that they're getting in the way, that they infringe on the ability to do business, that they, they harm innovation. And that is a very strong theme in an awful lot of the writing today. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that uh, you know, if you were to do a survey of every single uh, IP professor, I can't say how the numbers would come out, but you do, you do notice the people who are getting a lot of attention and who people are talking about and, uh, and who are having um, a disproportionate influence on other professors. And, and of those, I would say that over the past 20 years, they've been the anti-IP group. And we have a discussion. We have a discussion of, of the literature in the first chapter and talk about these people, mention their names, and cite their work. Um, so I think we have a, you know, a fair amount of evidence to support the view that uh, there's been a dominant anti-IP stream uh, going through the literature lately. Um, and I guess the, 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 you know, the real, the, the, the problem, the, the, um, the biggest problem with this is, again, the, the lack of a consistent, useful policy framework. Because the zero-sum framework that is implicit in the dominant critique of IP rights um, has no predictive positive theory when you apply it to the case law. Because so much of the law is, is inconsistent with the view. So it offers students nothing to work with. It offers, uh, it offers policymakers very little to work with, from what I can see. Um, un unless your view is that this, the cynical rent-seeking view is, is the view that should always be taken to an, an area like this. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think um, yeah, this is one area where I feel pretty strongly that this is the kind of approach, that this is the kind of pushback that needs to be offered in the literature. And this is the kind of framework that needs to be set out very clearly for people. One of the problems that in the literature is that is, 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 is though, even though there is a great deal of agreement with the framework that we have in this book, and if I did a survey, maybe I would find, as you're suggesting, the vast majority of IP professors agree with the framework that we have in this book. One of the problems is it's hard to find a very clear, simple statement of the framework. And so what we are trying to do is offer that in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a simple, straightforward, comprehensive way. Um, you know, and so uh, that hasn't been there so far. So talk about simple and comprehensive. Uh, without the benefit of a detailed seating chart, I have endeavored to keep uh, a cue. And I just apologize for slightly uh, uh, getting a few of these wrong. So uh, with your indulgence, let me just, I, I think next is over here. Um, uh, then back to the other side of the room here, then to the middle here uh, for two. Uh, so that, that's what I've got so far. Uh, and if there are others, uh, and sorry, and then uh, to the bow tie on the right. Um, uh, uh, so uh, if I missed you or gotten you out of order, I apologize. Uh, and uh, if you'd uh, uh, just keep catching my eye, I'll, I'll keep making sure we keep you involved and we've got some time. So please. It seems to me there's a, um, uh, a, Over a black and white dichotomy that's been set up that's um, not exactly fair accurate to perhaps those academics who aren't here to defend themselves. <laughs> um, it seems like both positions are right, but it depends on the industry. It's not a black and white question. Some people need a patent to have an, uh, an incentive to innovate. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense, like in the pharmaceutical industry, where a lot of uh, upfront R&D money has to be put in in hopes of recouping that money later on in your patent rights. There are industries that don't work that way. They have a different business model. And they don't need a patent as an incentive to innovate. Uh, being the first mover into the marketplace is enough as an incentive for them to, to innovate. And if it takes four years uh, to, to get your patent even looked at, well, by then you've already collected your millions on your invention. Uh, and so the, the real secret there is being the first to invent and the first to market. And that's enough of an incentive for them. 
in, in industries like that, mo mostly the high tech industry, um, patents actually are a problem because uh, they're used by competitors to uh, actually prevent you from uh, trying to bring your product to market. Mm -hmm. uh, and so high tech companies have to have patents, not because they're interested in innovating or in even inventing or in covering them with those patents, but because they have to protect themselves from patent lawsuits. Uh, the patent becomes basically, uh, I can sue you and you can sue me, and so it's a cold war. Uh, we won't sue each other and we'll both be able to sell our products, which is what they want to do in the first place. So patents really aren't fulfilling their, their, their role in that industry. Um, and so I was just wondering, how do you, you justify um, continuing to use patents in industries such as that where the incentive to innovate uh, is found elsewhere than in the patent right? Well, first of all, uh, one of the things we say in the book, and we go over this, different intellectual property types of protection have different benefit depending on the nature of the innovation. So you have uh, a long-lasting innovation like Coca-Cola, the formula for Coke, or Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, which is difficult, it's sufficiently complicated, it's difficult to reverse engineer. You need very precise uh, abilities to know what the uh, ingredients are and what the proportions are to be able to reverse engineer it. It's just not easy to do. So their trade secret works. Patent doesn't really uh, give you much there. In the business method, as we were saying, uh, the the sort of protection you really need there, you, you get in the competitive uh, nature. But if you're trying to separate out patents by, by industry, saying, you know, you should be able to get patents on pharmaceuticals but not on anything useful in the high-tech sector. Of course, a lot of what's useful in the high-tech sector is a real innovation that really does have a long-lasting importance and where the innovator may not be a business that's using it. So that uh, you, you want to have a way of incentivizing and compensating people for that. If you have, uh, a, a lot of people know, if, if you look at what's happening in the high-tech sector, you look at the Apple-Samsung trial, you look at some of the uh, cases that are brought and the quality of some of the patents, the problem isn't so much the ability to separate out patents by industry as having patents that really do meet the standards for patenting that really clearly meet the standards for patenting and then you can work out you know the, we also have some problems with litigation with what sort of system we have for litigation so there there are a lot of issues in this space and and neither of us is saying there aren't what we're saying is that the the easy answer isn't to say we're going to find industry and cut it out of the patent system because that's not going to you're going to have horrible problems uh, both in trying to border uh, to, to uh, patrol the borders there and problems in trying to get incentives for the right sort of innovations even within that industry so uh, you know I think we I mean there are two parts of your question uh, so there's a lot in there and if we tried to address everything you said we'd be here all day um, but part of it was seemed to uh, be about the, lit the literature and the theory, and part of it was about the real world and practice, and in terms of the, the literature and the arguments in there, that um, I, in general, I am in favor of uh, trying to uh, isolate the essential points that are being made and clarify and draw clear distinctions. So, um, so uh, you know, maybe maybe someone could say that we've separated things too far, created a black and white world. Um, I don't think I think there's a fair amount of support for the view that we're taking in the literature out there. Uh, and as a general matter, as 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 an academic, you know, I, I think part of my job is to clarify, make positions clear, and and not muddy things up by saying, well, so and so says this, but it's a footnote that says maybe he could be wrong. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, if, if he says that he makes an argument, he sticks his neck out. I'm going to say this is what he's doing. This is how he's sticking his neck out. And the and the rent-seeking literature that we refer to does sort of state its positions pretty boldly, even though there are a few qualifying remarks in there every now and then. So, so I, I'm in favor of clear distinctions, bold statements in academic lit writing and literature. Um, now, in terms of practice, the real world, you know, I don't think there's a big disagreement. We discuss some of the problems that you're talking about. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, that if you were to look at our, our treatment, I, I don't think you would see that us is sort of exaggerating or painting a, a black and white world in terms of what's happening out there. 
All right, let's let's uh, let's do this. We have a couple of other questions so far in the queue. We want to leave some time for uh, uh, book signing. So what we're going to do uh, with your uh, indulgence is take these three questions directly and then give the two authors a chance to respond to all three of them at once and then we'll close. So starting over here, please. I was just curious if either the panelists have an opinion on gene patents and their impact on medical innovation, whether it be good or bad. Okay, and the second, uh, so the first question is gene patents. The second question? Because you guys are, are interested in a policy-oriented view of this, I wonder whether you address the issue raised that, that intellectual property rights in practice aren't set by the courts or by the legislature directly, that they are contingent on the cost of attacking versus the cost of defending. Okay, and then our last. Does, does your book uh, address the retroactive extension of copyright protection? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll take the second one first. But you know your point about um, everything is contingent on litigation, people feeling strongly enough and being able to pay the money. Well, that's true. That's also true of litigation in, in general. Uh, true of all areas of law. So um, to the extent that it's it's a problem, uh, it's a problem that, that you know we, we can't uh, we can't avoid. And I think um, I don't I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, what what answer or what I would do differently. Um, the, ret the the other one is the retroactive application of IP retroactive, laws. retroactive extension of Eight, copyright. Oh, that's the Eldred case yes. that we talked about. Uh, well, I, I think that's an, that's an empirical issue. I, I think it's very hard to say as a matter of, of sort of a priori on the basis of some assumption that that's bad because. What we're doing in this book is we're talking about the static cost versus dynamic benefits, and so you, you kind of have to look into the details. Just simply because you, you have this retroactive extension uh, doesn't mean that there aren't dynamic benefits that are provided by that retroactive extension. Um, but I'll leave I'll leave it at that. I don't have much anything Gene. to say about I don't oh, have okay. anything to say. Is it you mean Gene Patton? Blue jeans or <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, I know. <laughs> if, if yours are blue, that's okay. fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Ron take that. As opposed to happy jeans. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, we, we, as Keith said, we do talk a little bit about uh, Eldred and about uh, the extension of copyright. Um, the uh, the gene issue, uh, I, I think. Uh, it, it ought to be subject to the same tests that there are for other patents. The question is really uh, how much innovation has gone into this and is it something that is properly within the scope of patent? And that, you know, that can be a, a complicated thing depending on what was done to isolate it and, and exactly what's involved in it. So I'm, um, I, I'm more um, agnostic on what we should be doing there um, in, without a specific you know, application to focus on, uh, on the, the cost of attacking versus the cost of defending. I think Keith is, is exactly right, the issue there. We, we have a system of uh, litigating everything. And to the extent the system doesn't work well, doesn't work efficiently, has high error costs, isn't good at parsing good from bad, the problems with that will flow through to every area. In, including the, the patent area. Uh, to the extent that it does a particularly good job of uh, selecting what is right and wrong according to the law in each case, uh, it, will, it will have better results. I remember when I started teaching patents, you know, the one of the first things that struck me was the, the law in the area wasn't nearly as complicated as it was in so many other areas. But applying it was really hard. Uh, and I think the, the only case I had the first year I taught patents that I was sure I understood the technology of was an, an old case dealing with toilet paper. Uh, I was sure I understood that technology. Uh, but everything else, it gets a, a little dicey. And, uh, and we had a, had a bow tie question? Would we get the button? Uh, no, I think you covered it. So, so let's, let's do this. Then please join me in thanking the authors.